Last week we talked about uh, the church's response not to persecution, but to certain heresies. Um, and we looked especially at Gnosticism and Montanism as, as two of the, um, the prompts to the church's thinking about what, what is Scripture and, and why. And as we move into the topic for today, it's, it's simply worth remembering um, that all of those things were taking place um, underground, as it were. Um, through the end of the, the third century, the church is still a minority uh, of the empire's population. Uh, Christianity itself is still illegal within the empire, and therefore it's um, quite regularly persecuted. Um, in fact, what is sometimes called uh, the Great Persecution um, takes place right at the end of the third century. But it's right at the beginning of the fourth century that, that all of this changes. And so the, the overarching question for today is simply, um, why do things change? And, and the short answer is Constantine. Um, a brief rundown of some of the things that change. Uh, in the very early fourth century, the year 313, uh, Christianity is officially legalized. Um, it is now a, a licit religion, a tolerated religion within the empire. Uh, persecution ceases. Uh, partly on account of that, uh, the population of Christians within the empire um, explodes very rapidly. And by mid-century, we're probably talking about 50% of the Roman Empire. Um, toward the end of the fourth century, Christianity is, is not only uh, legal, but it is in some respects made the official religion of the empire. And by this time, we're looking at a population of Christians within the empire somewhere in the order of, of 90%. And then lastly, uh, the, the ability of Christianity to come, to come out of the shadows, so to speak, uh, allows for it to um, convene organized assemblies of its theologians to, to publicly uh, debate doctrinal and administrative matters. And so still in the beginning of the fourth century, we have the, the church's first ecumenical or, or universal council at which is drafted the church's first ecumenical or universal statement of faith uh, in, in the form of the Nicene Creed. And again, all of this is made possible by Constantine uh, and by Constantine's uh, embracing of Christianity. And our fullest source and, and most uh, immediate source for our information about Constantine and the Council of Nicaea um, and, and the toleration of Christianity is, is an early historian by the name of Eusebius, uh, who was a bishop of Caesarea. And we're going to rely, uh, as we have in the past, primarily upon, upon one source or one individual, and, and this week it's going to be Eusebius. And, and this mention of Eusebius um, raises a, a series of questions that we'll want to, to touch on as we go. Uh, the first is simply, um, to what extent can Eusebius be trusted uh, as a historian? Um, and, and what I mean here is, is not so much can we trust the facts that he records, but, but um, should we take with a grain of salt perhaps some of his interpretations of the facts? Uh, second question um, is is how sincere was Constantine's commitment to Christianity? Uh, some people have questioned this. And then the third question, uh, and perhaps the one that is still most relevant, is um, was Constantine's legalization and, and patronizing of Christianity, um, was that good for the church or was it bad for the church? Now, the first question about, about Eusebius and, and his trustworthiness, well, we'll put that on hold uh, because he is our, our primary source. We, we really can't discuss these things without making reference to him. And we want to look at him in the context of the second question, Constantine's commitment to Christianity. And uh, the, the, the political backstory of Constantine's quote-unquote conversion, uh, we, we needn't go into in any depth, but, but let me just say this to set the context for, for a very lengthy quotation from Eusebius. Um, this, this quotation comes in the context of Constantine um, participating in a struggle uh, for the emperor's throne. The, the, this is the run-up to Constantine's battle with Maxentius in the year 312, Eusebius. Constantine 
regarded the entire world as one immense body and perceived that the head of it all, the royal city of the Roman Empire, was bowed down by the weight of a tyrannous oppression. He said that his life was without enjoyment as long as he saw the imperial city thus afflicted and so prepared himself for the overthrow of that tyranny. Being convinced, however, that he needed some more powerful aid than his military forces could afford him, he sought divine assistance. And he considered, therefore, on what God he might rely for protection and assistance. And he felt it incumbent upon him to honor his father's God. Accordingly, he called on him with earnest prayer and supplication so that he would reveal to him who he was and stretch forth his right hand to help him in his present difficulties. And while he was thus praying with fervent entreaty, a most marvelous sign appeared to him from heaven, the account of which it might have been hard to believe had it not been related by, had it been related by any other person. But since the victorious emperor himself, long afterwards, declared it to the writer of this history, when he was honored with his acquaintance and society, and confirmed his statement by an oath, who could hesitate to accredit the relation, especially since the testimony of after time has established its truth? He, Constantine, said that about noon, when the day was already beginning to decline, he saw with his own eyes the trophy of a cross of light in the heavens, above the sun, and bearing the inscription, Conquer by this. At this sight, he himself was struck with amazement, and his whole army, too, which followed him on this expedition, and witnessed this miracle. Then, in his sleep, the Christ of God appeared to him with the same sign which he had seen in the heavens, and commanded him to make a likeness of that sign which he had seen in the heavens, and to use it as a safeguard in all engagements with his enemies." At the time above specified, being struck with amazement at the extraordinary vision and resolving to worship no other god save him who had appeared to him, he sent for those who were acquainted with the mysteries of his doctrines and inquired who that god was. End of quote. Um, it, it is, to say the least, not your typical conversion story. And... and Unsurprisingly, this is part of the reason some people have, have questioned um, Eusebius' reliability. Um, it's worth noting that, that Eusebius does kind of go out of his way to say, hey, that there were other eyewitnesses um, who, who might substantiate this. Uh, Constantine's army uh, saw this in the sky as well. But again, we'll, we'll come back to this question of Eusebius. Um, for now... It's worth noting there's, there's just an inkling here of why some people have also questioned Constantine's uh, sincere commitment to Christianity. Um, that is to say, his initial appeal to this uh, vaguely understood Christian God is, is in the first instance a very pragmatic appeal. I'm going to battle. I, I want a God on my side who will help me win. Whichever God that is, maybe, maybe, maybe this uh, monotheistic God of my father. And, and we'll note... Um, a, a bit later, some further, uh, what we might call, pragmatic uses of Christianity by Constantine. But it, it's very worth noting that, that, that if Constantine is a mere sort of political military pragmatist looking for the God or the religion that might be of assistance to him, um, he picks a very strange time to, to do what this vision tells him to do, to, to, to put this sign of the cross uh, with the initials of Jesus on a banner, um, on, on the shields of his soldiers. And, and I say that he picks a very odd time to do that because um, he's, he's marching on the city of Rome, um, which is the center of, of the imperial pagan world. Um, the troops marching with him are not at all Christians. Um, he, he's not going to impress them by, by embracing an explicitly Christian symbol. Um, the population of the empire as a whole is, is by no means Christian, still probably about 10%. That is to say, um, Christians are not in a great position to be of assistance to Constantine. Um, as, as, a, as a military leader, 
or potentially as emperor. Um, they, they don't make up any great part of the military. Um, arguably, they don't even make up any part of the military at this point. Uh, the, the Christian church had been ambivalent to, to military service, uh, mostly to this point. Uh, some had joined the army, but, but at the end of the third century, they're all kicked out. So it, it is an odd time, if one is merely a pragmatist, to begin granting favors to a minority group that is in no position to repay those favors politically, and, and which might offend uh, the majority population of the empire. But this is precisely what Constantine does, uh, begin granting favors to this minority Christian population, uh, beginning most obviously in the year 313, when he grants his famous uh, Edict of Milan, uh, which is an imperial edict uh, proclaiming Christianity will, will henceforth be a licit, tolerated, legal religion. And, and perhaps pausing right here to specify, um, this, this does not make Christianity the, the official religion of the Roman Empire or, or the state religion. It's, it's now one of many legal religions. Uh, the, the edict specifically states, to each one, Freedom is to be given to devote his mind to that religion which he may think best adapted to himself. So everybody can, can choose their own religion, will we'll not persecute any. Um, which is, of course, for the Christians, a, a, an enormous favor. And, and it's not the only one. Um, even within the edict itself, the emperor continues uh, commenting on the, the properties that have been confiscated by the state in previous persecutions. Uh, these shall be restored as quickly as possible to the same Christians, with the understanding that if those who have bought these places or those who have received them as a gift from the state, if they demand anything in return, they may go to the judge of the district that provision may be made for them by our clemency. Um, that is to say, uh, the church has had property confiscated. This will be returned. This is complicated a little bit because the state has given some of this property or sold it to other people. Um, these people will return it to the church. And if they want, if they want payment for that, uh, come to me and, and this will come out of the imperial coffer. So he's, he's spending state money to return church property. Um, and, and even more. Um, in, a, in a letter he writes shortly after uh, this edict of toleration, he writes... It seems good to me that those men who give their services with due sanctity and with constant observance of the law to the worship of the divine religion should receive recompense for their labors. Uh, Christian clergy are now going to be put on the payroll of the state. And even more. Uh, in a letter to, to the Bishop of Carthage in North Africa, again shortly after this Edict of Toleration, 313, since I have learned that some men of unsettled mind wish to turn people from the most holy and Catholic church, without delay, go to the above-mentioned judges and report the matter to them, that they may be corrected as I commanded. Which is to say, Constantine is willing to, to throw his imperial weight behind the protection of Christianity, even from proselytization. Uh, in, in such light, um, Constantine does not simply appear to be a, a political pragmatist. He, he appears to be going you know, above and beyond the call of duty to show special favor to the Christian church in particular. And so we have to wonder, why, why would anyone question the emperor's sincerity with regards to Christianity? Um, but for some people, the answer is to be found even in these documents I've just mentioned. Uh, the Edict of Milan, which, which grants toleration. Um, Constantine explains how this question of toleration came about in the first place. He says, um, it was taken under consideration everything which pertained to the commonweal and prosperity. You know, this came up in the discussion of, of what's good for the empire, what, what's good for the commonwealth. 
And he concludes his justification for tolerating Christianity so that in this also provision may be made for the common and public tranquility. Uh, we, we want public peace, tranquility, calm. Uh, but we don't have that when, when we're persecuting Christians and, and when they're objecting. And, and even in that letter that he writes explaining that, that Christian clergy will now be paid out of imperial coffers, he's a bit more explicit. It appears, from many circumstances, he writes, that when religion is despised, great dangers are brought upon public affairs, but that when legally adopted and observed, it affords the most signal prosperity to the Roman name. For it seems that when they show greatest reverence to the deity, the greatest benefits accrue to the state. Which, which should sound a little bit familiar. When we talked about reasons for the imperial persecution of Christianity, uh, the most frequent justification was Christianity is bad for the state. Its suppression is good for the state. Um, Constantine is still enough of a Roman emperor to, to, to have somewhere in his mind uh, that the good of the state is, is really what I need to be considered, uh, concerned with. Which is not to say, of course, uh, that, that a sincere commitment to Christianity is, is incompatible or, or mutually exclusive with um, a concern for the good of the state. Uh, at least we hope not as, as we go to the polls. Um, and, and of course, um, we, we, we simply cannot presume, especially you know, two millennia hence, um, whether anyone's uh, faith or commitment uh, to the church and to its doctrine is, is sincere. And in some respects, uh, from a purely historical standpoint, um, it, it hardly matters what Constantine's motives were. Uh, because the outcome is the same. Uh, the church is officially tolerated, protected, uh, and, and patronized. Um, but it's this also that leads us back to that question about um, the reliability of Eusebius as a recorder of these events. And again, uh, nobody really questions whether, whether Eusebius is simply making up facts out of thin air. He's, he's not typically accused of that. Uh, the question is, is the slightly more subtle one of, of how, in, how Eusebius interprets uh, these events. And it's probably obvious that, that Eusebius is not recording events of this magnitude. The conversion of an emperor to Christianity the, the toleration of Christianity, the, the favoring of Christianity by the state, he's not simply recording these events for posterity. Uh, he's partly recording them because they make a point. And you, you see a small example of this when, when Eusebius um, records events when, when Constantine does victoriously march into Rome. He writes, um, with one voice and one mouth, all declared that Constantine had appeared by the grace of God as a general blessing to all mankind. Um, Eusebius himself, although he's here recording what, what, what the crowds seem to indicate, uh, this, is, this is very much what Eusebius himself also believes. Uh, that, that Constantine is a providential blessing, not only to the Roman state, uh, but to the church. And, and as this is uh, his firm belief, um, what he's writing is not just history, or, or at least not the, the sort of objective, entirely unbiased history that, that, that doesn't exist, but that, that sometimes people aspire to. He's also writing a, a kind of apologetic. And, and because he is, there are some notable parallels between Eusebius' work of history and, and the apologists that, that we saw a couple of weeks ago. Uh, so, for example, you might remember that Tertullian went, went to great pains to emphasize Christianity is not only not bad for the state, it's good for the state. And, and Eusebius emphatically agrees and so he's, he's, he's attempting to prove, to demonstrate that, that this will become manifestly evident in the person of 
a Christian emperor and in the presence of a legalized Christianity. Um, you re might remember, too, that, that an apologist like Justin Martyr um, or, or Clement of Alexandria um, are, are quite insistent that, that pagan philosophy does not necessarily contradict Christianity, at least the best of pagan philosophy. But instead, in some respects, Christianity is, is seen as the culmination of and, and fulfillment of the best of, of pagan philosophy. And, and something very much like this is Eusebius's point in the realm not of philosophy, but of, but of politics. Christianity and the Roman Empire are not incompatible. But in fact, Christianity and a Christian emperor will, will be the culmination and the fulfillment of all that was good about the old Roman Empire. With, with that sort of thing in mind, Eusebius is firmly convinced that, that, that both church and empire, now, now united in some respects in the person of Constantine, are, are just on the cusp of a golden age. And, and certainly, in the context in which Eusebius writes, um, there's, there's virtually no reason to question that. No reason to doubt that this will be the case. Let me, let me skip ahead a little bit uh, to, to Eusebius' account of the Council of Nicaea to give you a little example of this. Eusebius describes the, the, the bishops um, who arrive at the Council of Nicaea to, 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 to debate doctrine and to draft this first ecumenical creed. Um, here's how he describes um, some of those who arrive. Um, Paul, bishop of Neo Caesarea, had been deprived of the use of both hands by the application of a red-hot iron. Some had had their right eyes dug out. Others had lost their right arms. In short, this council looked like an assembled army of martyrs. Um, and, and it assembled, uh, it resembled an assembly of martyrs precisely because these people had, had lost limbs, lost eyes, uh, been tortured by previous imperial policy. But Eusebius describes events at the close of the council and writes, the emperor himself invited and feasted with those ministers of God. Not one of the bishops was wanting at the imperial banquet, the circumstances of which were splendid beyond description. Those men of God proceeded without fear into the innermost of the imperial apartments, in which some were the emperor's own companions at table, while others reclined on couches arranged on either side, easily one could imagine this to be the kingdom of Christ. Now, that is to say, um, these, these men who, who convene at the Council of Nicaea had, had been cruelly and viciously tortured on imperial orders a single generation ago. Here they are reclining on sofas with the emperor. Let your imagination run wild. Perhaps they're being fed grapes in clusters, being dangled by servants. Um, but but, but the, the radical change in circumstance uh, even allows Eusebius to say that, that one could imagine this to be the kingdom of Christ. I mean, who of these men could have imagined 30 years ago sitting down and, and sharing a meal with the emperor. Which, which leads to that, that third question. Um, was this legalization and, and patronizing of Christianity, was it good for Christianity? Um, Eusebius obviously thinks so. But even at the time, not everyone necessarily agrees. Um, Eusebius describes those, those bishops as, as looking like an assembled army of martyrs. And again, they looked like that on account of the persecution that had begun, uh, by, been begun by the late 3rd century emperor Diocletian. Often, they were tortured because they had refused to turn over copies of Scripture uh, to be burned. Other bishops, however, did not refuse. 
Um, when the soldiers arrived at the door requesting that that scripture be turned over, um, some of them refused, were imprisoned, were tortured. Others did not refuse and, and simply gave up their scriptures. And in some quarters, there's, there's a very severe backlash against these bishops. Uh, they, they come to be referred to as, as traditores, or in, in English, traitors. Exactly. Um, and, and the question, once persecution ceases, is well, what are we to do with and what are we to make of these bishops who had voluntarily surrendered Scripture? Um, one party is saying, well, who knows what, what any of us would have done in a similar circumstance. So, so if they are properly uh, repentant, uh, we will recognize them as, as true bishops and, and we'll reinstate them. Uh, there's another party that says, no, not on your life. Um, and, and this party comes to be known uh, as, as the Donatists, uh, so named after uh, Donatus, who is, who is consecrated uh, as a bishop or, or an anti-bishop in the year 313, the very year that Constantine officially legalizes Christianity. And these Donatists simply refused to recognize that, that any priest who had surrendered Scripture is a true priest. So, so they do not rec recognize uh, if this person is a bishop, their, their ordination or consecration of other clergy, uh, the validity of their baptisms or their uh, celebration of, of the Eucharist. And, and this grows into a, a schism within the church. Uh, I should note that the church within North Africa, it's, it's a fairly localized schism, but it's a long-lasting schism. Um, for, for at least two centuries, uh, the church in North Africa is divided on this question. And I, and I want to get sidetracked into a discussion of Donatism, but, but to, to grossly oversimplify, here's what it comes down to. Uh, the, the sentiment of the Donatist is something like this. The bad old days of persecution might have been the bad old days, but they made for good Christians. Because you didn't enter the church unless you were very serious about it. Because you knew full well that doing so could lead to your martyrdom. And on the other hand, these, these now good old days, when, when Christianity is tolerated in the empire, is also leading to a certain tolerance of not-so-great Christians, uh, perhaps even pseudo-Christians within the church. Now, uh, the Donatists, again, that they are consistently condemned. Um, so we, we need not get sidetracked uh, with them. Uh, but there is a, another movement growing up at exactly the same time that, that has many analogies to Donatism, and yet not only remains within the bounds of Christian orthodoxy, uh, but, but goes on to become one of the, the single most influential movements in the history of the church. And, and the analogies are due because there, there's a common concern that is traced back to this question of, of martyrdom. You know, the, the Donatists complained some bishops were not willing to be martyred, and, and, and so they abandoned scriptures. And this question of, of martyrdom is, is a pressing one. Because in the old church, um, the martyrs were the ideal Christians. Uh, the, the, they were the, the epitome of what it meant to be a follower of Christ. Uh, they were the heroes of the church. You might remember um, Tertullian's phrase uh, that the blood of the martyrs is the seed of the church. Um, we, we didn't talk uh, about origin uh, of Alexandria, but, but origin is perhaps a good example of, of how highly martyrdom was esteemed. Um, Origen's own father um, dies a martyr in one of the, the persecutions. And, and he is so awed by this um, that, that he also, as a teenager, wants to, to die as a martyr. Um, his, his mother has to step in and, and hide all of his clothes to prevent him from leaving the house um, in order to prevent him from going out and getting himself martyred. Um, but, 
But Origen is not unique. Uh, this, this sort of desire for martyrdom becomes so common that the bishops quite regularly have to, to announce the, the martyrs are blessed. But if you go out seeking or, or provoking your own martyrdom, we're not going to recognize you as a martyr. Uh, we're going to recognize you as an idiot. Um, but, but, but the point remains, martyrdom was the ideal when it existed. Now it doesn't. Um, conversely, here's, here's how one historian of, of the post-Constantinian church uh, describes things. Um, those stalwart believers whom Diocletian had killed were now replaced by a mixed multitude of half-converted pagans. Um, that, that, that jump in, in you know, church membership from 10% to 50%, um, this, this author is saying, brought a lot of chaff in with the wheat. And, and, and some people, even at the time, saw examples of this even in the highest echelons of the church. Um, one example, in, the, in, in mid-century, around 360, there is a, there is a um, contested election for the position of Bishop of Rome. Um, you, you needn't uh, concern yourself with the names, um, but, but the, the losing side um, found uh, more than 130 of its supporters uh, mysteriously killed, sometimes not so mysteriously. And if you recall uh, another of Tertullian's quotations, uh, in the second century, Tertullian describing what, what pagans are saying about Christians, see how they love one another? Um, in this new context, um, here's what the pagans are saying. Uh, the pagan historian Ammianus Marcellinus writes, um, There are no wild beasts so hostile to mankind as most of the Christians are to one another. Now, of course, in some respects, that's, that's to be entirely expected from a pagan polemicist against Christianity. Um, more importantly, uh, some Christians are, are wont to agree with that sort of, of assessment. I mean, the question they raise is, is, where is that old ideal of the martyr? You know, the, the person willing to, to sacrifice his own life for the sake of Christ, as compared to this, this, this new willingness to sacrifice others for one's own benefit. And the answer to that question um, is, is being worked out even as that era of persecution comes to an end. And the answer is that this, this concept of martyr or martyrdom um, is increasingly being generalized. Um, so already in the third century, um, Cyprian can speak of the martyrdom of celibacy. Um, in the, the late 4th, early 5th century, um, Sulpicius Severus can say, to fast, to pray unceasingly, uh, to lacerate the flesh, this also is a kind of martyrdom. And, and the, the people who, who make this their ideal, to, to, to fast, to pray unceasingly, to, to take vows of celibacy, um, are that 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 group of individuals who come eventually to be known as monks. And already at this time, there are an increasing number of them uh, fleeing into the desert to do these, these monastic works, uh, to, to, to remain celibate, uh, to, to pray unceasingly, to fast. And, and the point here, again, uh, we don't want to go off on a long tangent about monasticism, but the, but the point here is that, that when we often think about monks and monasticism, um, we, we might tend to think of people who are, who are fleeing from the world to, 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 to live their life in a cloister away from the world. There, there's something to that, but, but in its earliest incarnation, a number of these individuals are not so much fleeing the world as they are the worldliness of the church itself, uh, of the church in this new post-Constantinian uh, tolerant age. 
Um, the, the, the single most uh, significant of these individuals is, is a person by the name of Antony, um, sometimes, sometimes referred to as the father of this, this early desert monasticism. Um, his, his particular fame is due in large part to his, auto, uh, sorry, his biography being written um, by another famous individual, um, Athanasius. And, and Antony and Athanasius both come from the North African Egyptian city of Alexandria. And with this mention of Alexandria, um, we, can, we can come to the last episode uh, that, that we want to talk about today, which is uh, the, the convening of that first ecumenical council um, and the drafting of that first ecumenical, universal statement of Christian belief in the form of the Nicene Creed. And it's this last episode that, that also uh, raises the question in some people's minds of, of whether Constantine's involvement with the church, patronizing of the church, was, was good or bad for the church. Um, and the controversy uh, begins in Alexandria. Um, here's one, one early historian's brief introduction to the controversy. Um, at that time in Alexandria, Arius, who had been enrolled in the list of the presbytery, and entrusted with the exposition of Holy Scripture, fell prey to the assaults of jealousy when he saw that the helm of the high priesthood was committed to Alexander. Stung by this passion, he sought opportunities for dispute and contention. And while the patriarch, Alexander, in obedience to Holy Scripture, taught that the Son is of equal dignity with the Father, and of the same substance with God who begat him, Arius, in direct opposition to the truth, proclaimed that the Son of God is merely a creature or created being, adding the famous dictum, there once was a time when he was not. Uh, this is, this is uh, the, the, the origins of the Arian controversy. And uh, the most immediate dealing with this is that, that, that Alexander, the patriarch of Alexandria, uh, convenes a local synod of bishops, uh, about a hundred in number, um, and they agree with him that, that what Arius is saying, uh, that, that Christ is a creature, that, that Christ did not always exist, um, is heretical. Uh, Arius is excommunicated um, and, and uh, relieved of his position within the church. But he refuses to go quietly, um, and, and he begins rallying to himself allies uh, among the bishops in the eastern half of the empire. And by the year 324, uh, four years after his excommunication, um, this has become a controversy consuming the whole eastern half of the empire. Um, and the year 324 is, is also significant because it's the year in which Constantine um, unites both halves of the empire um, in one imperial office. Um, he is now uh, sole emperor of both east and west. And upon um, taking control of the east, the last thing he wants is the kind of controversy that he finds. Uh, one, one, one quotation to give you some little sample of, of how much this controversy was, was engaging people's attention. Uh, the, the bishop of Con in Constantinople um, writes this. If in this city you ask someone for change, he will discuss with you whether God the Son is begotten or unbegotten. If you ask about the quality of bread you will receive the answer that God the Father is greater, God the Son is less. If you suggest that a bath might be desirable, you will be told there was nothing before God the Son was created. You know, that is to say, um, nobody wants to talk about anything except this dispute between Arius and his supporters and Alexander and his supporters. And again, that's precisely the sort of thing that, that, that an emperor attempting to unite an empire does not want division. And so, as Eusebius explains, the emperor, 
like some general bishop constituted by God, convened a synod of his ministers. Nor did he disdain to be present and sit with them in that assembly. And he doesn't merely, uh, Constantine does not merely sit with them in the assembly. Eusebius continues, uh, the emperor gave patient audience to all alike. He received every proposition with steadfast attention, and by occasionally assisting the argument of each party in turn, he gradually disposed even the most vehement disputants to a reconciliation. Persuading some, convincing others by his reasoning, praising those who spoke well, and urging all to a unity of sentiment, until at last he succeeded in bringing them to one mind and judgment, respecting every disputed question. And the fact that it's Eusebius himself who is telling us this um, is especially noteworthy, um, in part because Eusebius was there. Um, he's an eyewitness. He was, he was one of the bishops present at the council. But it's also significant because Eusebius himself was one of those being persuaded convinced and, and urged by the emperor. Um, Eusebius of Caesarea had arrived at the council with a certain amount of sympathy for the Arian position, uh, the position of Arius. Um, so much so that, that, that he writes a letter to uh, the Arian party after the council, um, having to defend himself because they were accusing him of, of having switched sides. Hey, we, we thought you were with us, but, but, but you came out of the council agreeing with, with, with Alexander. And in the course of this letter, he describes that, that he had been the one who had, who had put on the table uh, the creed uh, that, that was used in his church for, for catechumens uh, when, when they were being received into the church. And he describes uh, what happened like this. Now, when this formulary, this creed, had been set forth by us, there was no room to gainsay it. Our beloved emperor himself was the first to testify that it was most orthodox, and that he coincided in opinion with it. And he exhorted the others to sign it and to receive all the doctrine it contained, with the single addition of the one word, consubstantial. That is to say, uh, of the same substance, or, or in the, 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 the Greek, uh, homoousius. Um, that is, according to Eusebius, um, not only does the emperor, quote, behave like some bishop in convening this council, uh, not only does the emperor himself uh, mediate and, and in some ways even direct the course of the council, but the emperor himself proposes that that decisive word that will be enshrined in the Nicene Creed, um, clarifying uh, for all ages uh, that, that the Son of God, Jesus Christ, is of the same substance as God himself. Now for Eusebius, um, that is just one more bit of evidence that Constantine's rise to emperor was, was part of God's providential plan for the good of the church. For others, um, it was a further hint of problems to come with a too close association between uh, what we would today call church and state, or, or even a too close association between the church and worldly prestige, worldly power, and authority. Um, again, it doesn't have to be one or the other. Um, perfectly possible to say that, that Constantine's uh, conversion, legalization of Christianity, patronizing of Christianity, calling of a, of a general council, um, guiding that council towards the drafting of the Nicene Creed, um, we're, we're both good and bad for the church. Um, and, and I'll not, not recommend a side to take per se, but, but here's what we can say, again, just in, in historical terms, that, that by the fourth century, by the end of the fourth century, 
we've come an awful long way from, from where we began. Uh, the church is no longer a persecuted minority. Um, it's an imperially favored majority. And that majority is now in possession of a relatively well-defined canon of Scripture. It's in possession of a relatively well-defined, concise statement of faith uh, that will be adopted uh, by all Christians. And then we're off and running. Um, what happens next um, will be for some other time. Uh, <laughs> But again, thank you for um, the, the past few weeks. I've greatly enjoyed it, and uh, I, I hope you have too. Um, again, since we've, we've run over time, uh, you are certainly free to leave without uh, giving offense. But if you do have a couple of questions, I'll, I'll be happy to stick around for a few more minutes and answer. Yes? Just one observation. Uh, fortunate to be able to visit the Vatican a few years ago, and the, the o overwhelming impression that you get when you visit, particularly behind the, the um, church itself, is that uh, there is so much Roman um, statuary mm. that is very unchristian, <laughs> uh, very obviously pagan. Um, in its thoughts as well as its its substance, and when you talk to the people there, they they will say, "Oh well, you know, they were so very good at incorporating the pagan religion into Christianity," and it's it, it that certainly is is um, evident. In, um, so, and so, and and that's. Um that, that is going to be something of a theme throughout the history of Christianity, um, that uh, a debate between what, what do we do in, in the context of, of evangelizing, for example. Um, do we uh, try to, to baptize um, native customs um, to, to, to make them Christian? Um, or do we attempt to sweep those entirely away and introduce something entirely new? Um, and, and yeah, and it's 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 partly such a uh, an intense uh, an intensely debated question because not only is there the question of you know which will which will work better, but but if you opt for the second, sweep all the old away and introduce some sort of you know pure untainted Christianity, you know, the question is well, are you introducing a, a pure untainted Christianity or, or are you introducing you know a Pick your time and place, a, a 19th century British version of Christianity or a 21st century Southern Californian version of Christianity. Um, so yeah, it's, it's an issue then and it's going to remain an issue. Of the three creeds, which one came first? Ah, good question. Of the three creeds, which one came first? Um, well, the Nicene Creed is, is certainly the, the earliest universally accepted, adopted creed. Um, although even there we've got to be a little bit careful. Uh, the, the, the Nicene Creed that we say here on, on Sunday mornings, oh, well, I guess we said the apostles this morning, um, isn't exactly the same as the one drafted here at the Council of Nicaea. Uh, there, there's going to be another ecumenical council in, in Constantinople that, that, that fleshes out the third article a little bit on the Holy Spirit. Um, and then even at a later date, there's going to be one more word inserted that's going to cause problems with, with the Eastern and Western churches. But, uh, but the short answer is the Nicene Creed is the first. Um, lots of creeds that look very much like what we call the Apostles' Creed are in existence before that. Um, but, but none of them looks exactly like the Apostles' Creed, and, and none of them is before the Nicene Creed sort of universally in use. Uh, that's a good question. Uh, before the eighth century, um, but yeah, it's 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 not written by Athanasius. <laughs> Who would have guessed? Yeah. Yes. Uh, Josephus. There's the works of Josephus. Is there a compilation of the works of 
Of Eusebius? Yes. Um, yes, good question. Um, Eusebius writes um, what is titled uh, The Ecclesiastical History. So the history of the church um, to his day. Um, that's, that's his main work. He, he writes a lot of other things. Um, it's a single volume. It's a single volume. Um, part, of, uh, part of what I drew from for quotations, he, he also writes a separate uh, Life of Constantine, a biography of Constantine. Um, part of it is, is reduplication of what you find in the ecclesiastical history. Um, but yes, this, Eusebius is, is credited with writing the, the first history of the church. And for a long time, what we get are simply um, additions to Eusebius. So someone in the 5th century said, eh, here's where Eusebius left off. I'm going to bring it up to date. So yeah. Um, yeah. And in, in fact, our own um, Paul Meyer um, has done a very uh, readable translation of Eusebius' ecclesiastical history that you can get inexpensively in paperback. Just curious about the influence of the North Africa church uh, then and now. Right. And what your impression of why? Um, the North African church in general or in the context of this Donatist controversy? And what we're seeing today in terms of uh, sort of an orthodox resurgence kind of influencing the West. Right, right. Good question. Um, the... the the North African church is, is always hugely influential um, in, in a number of ways. And, and so I, do, I, in part, don't even know where to begin answering the question. Um, some, somebody asked, I think, last week or the week before about, uh, about Pelagianism. Um, Augustine uh, is, is a North African. Uh, he's, he's going to be, uh, I think, unarguably the single most influential theologian of the church um, in antiquity, um, arguably through the Middle Ages, um, and he is very much influenced by the sorts of things that are happening both before him and, and during his day in North Africa. Uh, one is the Donatist controversy. Um, this is going to partly uh, prompt uh, Augustine to reflect on uh, what do we mean by the church, um, and, and why do we uh, trust baptism to forgive sins? Is, is it because uh, the, the priest is, is untainted by any sort of uh, you know, mortal sin? Or, or is it just because baptism is, is God's gift to us, regardless of, of who is administering baptism? Um, the Pelagian controversy, um, I mean, sorry, the, uh, yeah, the Pelagian controversy um, is, is going to, uh, again, rock the North African church. Uh, Augustine is there going to formulate his, his thinking about, well, how are we saved? Um, is it, or, and must it be by grace? Or is it, as, as Pelagius is saying, eh, grace helps, but, but technically you don't need it. Um, you, can, you can save yourself by doing good works. Um, I don't think... Well, I go beyond that. There is no way to draw a direct line from the influence of the North African church in antiquity to uh, the, the, the resurgence of the African church today. And, and it's, for example, sending missionaries to Europe um, because well, Europe's not Christian anymore. Um, uh, and, and part of the reason we can't draw a direct line is because all of those influential North African centers become and remain for a long time Muslim. Um, so there is, uh, there, there's no way to draw a direct line. But, um, but it is, you're, you're absolutely right, becoming again hugely influential in, in world Christianity. So thank you for, for, for mentioning that. And again, thank, thank all of you for, for the last five weeks. I've enjoyed it.